I've titled my message, An Overused Muscle. And so, if you found Proverbs 15, or if not, you can uh, listen to me read it here. It goes like this. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools pour out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. If you want to look at verse 18, it says, A hot-tempered man starts or stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. And then verse 23 says, To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season how good it is. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time in your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord. Um, I know it's raining and it's thundering. I pray that you keep the power on. And Lord, I pray that um, your word would go forth today, Lord, and uh, keep us uh, focused on you. Help us to worship you now uh, through our listening and leaning into what you would speak to us, Lord. I believe that none of this is my words, that they are from you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would lean into what you would speak to our hearts. And, uh, Lord, I pray that we would leave challenged and different than how we came in uh, today, Lord. So uh, be with us. Uh, and uh, it's your name we pray. And everybody who agreed said, amen. 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 Well, I've titled my message an overused, tongue, or an overused muscle. And today what we've hit is a topic on the tongue, our words, or our speech. And... Um, what I love is the fact that I get to teach this because it's something that I'm still learning in my own life, how to control my tongue, my mouth, my speech, uh, because it's something I haven't mastered. And I think if we're honest, we all haven't mastered that. We all struggle in that area. Often, if I'm counseling someone and there's a lot of anger, I remind uh, the people that I'm counseling, I'll say uh, that I have Irish, German, and Russian all inside of me. And so if anybody has a right to be angry and mad all the time, it's me. So, uh, <laughs> but... Um, what I hope that you will gather from this is uh, some things that will challenge you in, in how you speak to one another. And I, the thing is, is when we think about Proverbs, a lot of times we just think, of, we don't really think about the tongue or a mouth or the words that we say. A lot of times we just think of uh, a collection, that there's a collection of wisdom on how to live our life. Um, and Proverbs is that. It's given mostly in short, memorable statements without much context or organization, so when we're reading Proverbs, sometimes uh, it can feel kind of confusing or a little disjointed. And if you've read Proverbs 15, that's kind of where we're at. They're kind of random Proverbs sayings. They're kind of like those quick quips, you could say, that we can just kind of listen to, apply to our life, and move on to the next one. Whereas like Proverbs 1 through 9 were more thematic in what they were dealing with. There was a theme throughout those Proverbs. And now we come to one that's a little disjointed and can be confusing. But, it, but one of the subjects here in Proverbs 15 is about our tongue, about our words, and about our speech. And um, uh, in fact, uh, the subject of the tongue and how we use our words is one of the primary subjects of Proverbs. In fact, over 150 times, Proverbs refers to our lips, to our tongue, or to our mouth, or to our speech. Words are important. After all, God created the universe. God spoke and things were created. God spoke the existence of where we're at today. God separated the land and the waters. He created them animals. He spoke and all of that came to be. You can read all of that in Genesis uh, 1. God also spoke the Ten Commandments when he talked to Moses. He spoke those into existence. Even Jesus in his earthly ministry spoke and people were healed. Jesus spoke and dead men came out of graves. Even I love the, the story in um, the Gospels where the disciples and Jesus, they're on this boat and they're traveling the sea and uh, this huge storm comes up and the disciples are freaking out and Jesus rebukes the storm and he calms the storm and everything is calm. Words are powerful. Words are impactful. But why are words so important? I think it's because of the amount of words that we do use. Each person here today will open their mouth an average of 700 times in a day. Now, I don't want husbands and wives to go home and say, my wife talks way more than 700 times in a day, you know, and I don't want my, I don't want wives to be like, well, my husband says about three words, good morning, what's to eat, good night, you know, like I don't want any of that. But on average, every single one of us here opens our mouth an average of 700 times a day. And in those 700 times, we'll say about 18,000 words. 
Now, to give you a little context today, uh, in my message today, it's about 15,000 words-ish. So in just the three messages, I'll come very close to that average just today alone. So 700 times a day, we'll open our mouths, we'll say 18,000 words, and so in an entire year, we'll say 66 books, and we'll fill up those books with 800 pages in each of them. It's a lot of words. No wonder why Jesus said, by your words, you will be condemned, and by your words, you will be justified. The amount of words we use is amazing. But I think another reason why words are important is because of the amazing power of our words. Your words are important because you either say something worthwhile or you say something not worth anything at all. I looked up some powerful words that made some powerful statements in in our history, and uh, you might be familiar with some of them. Neil Armstrong said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Uh, John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask instead what you can do for your country. I love this one by Thomas Edison. It says, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. I love that one. You might be familiar with this one by Forrest Gump. My mama always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And then, of course, the great poet of the 1990s, the notorious Biggie Smalls, said, Mo money, mo problems. But words are important, and words can be powerful. God created us to be verbal beings. But just like food, sex, and money, if words are allowed to run wild without restraint, or if there are no boundaries, or if words are used in abusive ways, they can be deadly. Solomon, who wrote most of Proverbs, said this in Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Now, we don't need to raise hands on this because The Lord sees it all anyways, but how many of us, if we're honest, spoke a reckless word this week? And some of you, you're honest about it. That's good. We all speak reckless words from time to time. Maybe you said something to a coworker, a friend, or a roommate, or maybe uh, it was to one of your kids. You just kind of got caught up in the heat of the moment and a reckless word came out. Or maybe for you, you were kind of arguing with your spouse and you were disagreeing about something and a reckless word came out and you wish you wouldn't have said the thing that you said. But then the opposite is also true. How many of us this week were on the receiving end of a reckless word? It's amazing how one word can cut open, can pierce our hearts. One word like ugly, fat, loser, a phrase, a joke could cut deeper than any sword could ever penetrate. And so my question is, why then do we still speak reckless words? We all do it from time to time. None of us are exempt from it. We know how reckless words can hurt people that we love and that we care for. And we know that it can cut them to the core. I mean, we've all been on the receiving end of reckless comments towards us, yet we still can't help but speak reckless words back to other people. So I have an illustration that might kind of help us understand this a little bit more. I've invited um, a couple here today. Yes, they fit in this bag. And um, you might be like, what's going on? But uh, I want to introduce you to Mr. Mug. And uh, well, Mrs. Mug, she's a little shy here. She's got her hair kind of like all getting in her face and all of that. And so here's Mr. and Mrs. Mug. Here's the thing about Mr. and Mrs. Mug. Um, they met uh, while they were dating in college, and uh, Mr. Mug uh, saw Mrs. Mug, and uh, he said, and I'm not going to say it was love at first sight, but he went up to Mrs. Mug, and he said, Mrs. Mug, is your last name Campbell's because you look mm-mm good? <laughs> so he's a charmer, you know? And so Mr. Mug... Mr. Mug, you know, he's not so bad looking himself. He's got a mustache and he's a pre-med student. So, you know, he's got a good future ahead of himself. And so he's got it going on. And so Mr. and Mrs. Mug, there they are. They're dating. They have no hurtful comments, no words exchanged. They're very careful with one another. Of course, every now and then they would bump each other, but, you know, nothing too bad. They were always very cautious with one another. And then they got married. And then they do what married people do. It's the thing that God invented. God expects this in marriage. And that is they created baby mug together. And here comes baby mug. Now, baby mug, he's all cute and stuff on the outside. But the reality is baby mug is not that cute at two in the morning. Baby mug is crying. 
and crying and crying. And Mr. Mug, you know, being the guy that he is, lays there and hopes that Mrs. Mug will take care of baby Mug. And he lays there with one eye open, hoping that Mrs. Mug will get up and take care of baby Mug. And if she doesn't, he might stir a little bit or he might give Mrs. Mug a quick kick to see if she'll kind of get up, you know. And so Mrs. Mug, she's tired, but she's taking care of this baby. And she's a little emotional now. It's been a couple months since she's had the baby. And now comes her birthday. And Mr. Mug thinks, you know what? I'm going to rock this birthday. I'm going to be husband of the year with this birthday. I'm going to get Mrs. Mug something that she really needs. And what does Mr. Mug give her? He gives her exercise, like, exercise lessons. That didn't go over real well with Mrs. Mug, as you can imagine. And so they bumped and stuff came out. And Mr. Mug was like, whoa, where did this come from? I'm just trying to be husband of the year here. You know, like I'm trying to get you a good gift. And yet you're, you're saying that this isn't good enough. And so they bumped again and more stuff came out. So Mrs. Mug... She leaves, and um, of course, she goes to her sister's house. And Mr. Mug, you know, we don't know where he went because he doesn't really, guys don't really talk about things like that. So he just sat on the couch and he thought about it for a while. And he thinks, she makes me so mad if she would just stop bumping me. Well, then I wouldn't say things like that. And here's the point Mr. Mug thinks the reason why reckless and hurtful words come out of him is because Mrs. Mug keeps bumping him. And Mrs. Mug thinks the reason why she speaks reckless and hurtful words to Mr. Mug is because he keeps screwing up and bumping into her. And if he would just stop doing that, well, then she wouldn't speak reckless words to him. But here's the truth. The reason why the white marshmallows come out of Mr. Mug is because that's what's in there. And the reason why the pink marshmallows come out of Mrs. Mug is because that's what's in there. And so here's my point to this silly analogy is this. That every word that slips out of your mouth, every reckless, common, every hurtful kind of word is a reflection of what's in here, what's in your heart. Jesus said, the words you speak come from the heart. I remember growing up and um, if I was making fun of my sister or if I was making fun of somebody, of somebody else, my parents would always tell me, hey, watch your mouth. Maybe you have parents who said that to you or maybe you're a parent that says that to your kids. But Jesus takes it a step further. He says, don't only just watch your mouth, watch what's inside your heart. Because your mouth speaks what's in your heart. Jesus says this in Luke 6, 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. And it's really just that simple. And so when we speak angry words, it's because there's anger inside of our hearts. When we speak bitter words, it's because we have bitterness towards another person. And when we speak reckless words, it's because our heart lacks self-control. And it's those reckless words that pierce like a sword. But then the second half of Proverbs 12, 18 says, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. A carelessly chosen word can destroy a friendship. A carelessly chosen word can destroy a marriage. A carelessly chosen word can ruin a dream. But a carefully chosen word can start a friendship. A carefully chosen word can restore a marriage. And a carefully chosen word can bring hope to another person's life. This one little muscle in your mouth has more powerful than all the other muscles in your body combined. I love what Proverbs 25, 15 says. It says, a gentle tongue can break a bone. What it means is that gentle responses have more power than brute force. You may have a lot of muscles on your body, and trust me, look at me, I know a lot about what that means. You may have a lot of muscles on your body, but this is the one muscle, the tongue, that you have to learn how to control. This is the muscle that makes all the difference in the world. And you know what's funny to me is it's the one muscle that never gets sore. You never wake up and do tongue stretches before you start talking. Nobody does that. And it's also the one that never, you never pull your tongue muscle. You're like, oh, I can't talk for six to eight weeks. I'm out, you know? Like, it's the one muscle that never gets sore, that never gets hurt. You might bite it from time to time, but that has nothing to do with you talking. But we can all think of people in our life or in our world who need to give their tongues a little bit of a rest, too. But it's the one muscle we have to learn how to control. And so I want to give you three reasons from Proverbs 15 on why we need to watch our words. The first is my words affect my behavior. 
Proverbs 15, one says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. If you're married here today, God may have brought you to church just to hear this verse. If you have kids, this verse is crucial for you as a parent. Or if you have a roommate or friends that you live with, or maybe you work in a place where uh, people get a little stressed out and worked up every once in a while, then this verse is for you. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I remember not too long ago, I didn't apply this verse too well in my own life. Um, uh, I was working some late nights a couple months ago here at the church, and by late, I mean I'm coming home at maybe 9 o'clock at night, 8 o'clock at night, so most of all the activity, in the house, and then I'm out early in the morning, and so I, you know, for that week, I wasn't really at home a whole lot. And um, so I was noticing as I was coming home every day, I was like, man, this house keeps getting messier and messier. And the one thing about my wife, Jen, you have to know is I won't say that she loves to clean, but she likes a tidy house. And I think we could all agree with that. We like to have a nice house, a clean place to be. I'm okay if things are a little unorganized every now and then. You know, I'm not talking the whole house is like you have to shovel a pathway to where you're going, but I don't mind a little disorganization if the kids are done playing. In fact, I remember one time, uh, we were, uh, we came home from an event here at the church and we were both tired. We got the kids to bed. The kids had left some toys out. There were some dishes in the sink. I went right to bed. Jen went and she started cleaning up the living room and the, and the dishes in the sink. And I was like, what are you doing? She's like, I can't sleep knowing the house is a little disorganized. And I was like, well, I'm just fine. So don't wake me up, you know? And so, <laughs> so, um, she did that. So she likes the clean house. And so I just remember coming home and every day I was like, man, this house is getting messier and messier. What's going on? And so I walk in the house like the fourth day and I was like, why is this house such a dump? Now, all right. I feel bad about it now, okay? So uh, I'm just going to tell you guys, this isn't how you want to uh, say hello to your wife. This isn't like something that you should ever lead with. Like, this is not a good thing, okay? It's not a good idea, not a good plan. So I said that. So I was there with a little energy and a little enthusiasm, and I was met with a little more energy and a little more enthusiasm. And so I was like, I, I don't even know. I can't do this anymore. And so I walked into the room. And you know, sometimes when you're in a fight, you're just kind of like talking to yourself. You're kind of pep talking your own self. Like, I'm right in this. I know that I'm right. Why am I the only one who's got to make sure this house is clean? You know, what are they doing all day? Are they just watching uh, TV shows and taking naps? Like, what's going on here? You know, that's what I'm thinking in my mind. And I know that that's not true. And I, it was like as if I could hear the Lord speak to me and say, do you really believe that? Do you really think that's what's happening right now? And then I just remember him telling, reminding me of this verse. And so then I went in and I apologized for that. And I, I said we were sorry and we were good after that. And the house is all clean now, so it's good too. So, um, but I apologized and I said that I was sorry. But it, what it reminds me is that uh, gentle words, gentle tones, gentle responses are like waters on the fire of conflict. It'll drench whatever fight that you're in. And I would urge you this week to memorize this verse. Because every single one of you could start to live out this verse. And if we could start to learn to live out this verse, then it would change the way that we relate to one another. It would change how we are relationally to one another if we could memorize this verse and apply it to our lives. Proverbs 10, 11 says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Do you ever wonder why some people seem to get all the breaks in life and other people just seem to get nothing but trouble? Well, this verse here in Proverbs 10 indicates that how we talk and how we speak might have something to do with it. The words of the righteous, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Another translation puts it, the words of the godly lead to life. Now, this word life refers to love, joy, prosperity, and relational well-being. He's saying that the quality of your words will have at least some effect on the quality of your life. And I think we all know this to be true. If you want a more quality life, speak more quality words. Think about it. The people who get promoted, it's always the people who are positive, who are encouraging, and they have control over their tongue. But the opposite is also true. He says, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. And what that means is that people who use violent kind of speech, anger, harsh tones, hurtful comments, they create an environment of fear, fighting, and loss. 
There's a direct correlation between your words and your behavior. I remember uh, I was probably about six or seven years old, and uh, to kind of go with this idea that there's a direct correlation between your words and your behavior, I remember um, <coughs> my parents would always tell me that I had a big mouth. And I kind of wore it as like a badge of honor, like I was really proud of it, like, okay, well, that means I can scream louder than anybody else, I can sing louder, I can talk louder, I can say whatever's on my mind, you know, I kind of wore it as like that badge of honor. Until one day I was coming out of my room and I overheard my parents talking to somebody and they said, does this kid ever shut up? And I just remember thinking, just because I can do all of those things, just because I can be loud and sing and, be, and do whatever, <laughs> say whatever's coming out of my mouth, that doesn't mean that I should say all of those things. But our words have this incredible effect on our behavior. Here's reason number two to watch your words. My words direct where I go. Proverbs 15, 4 says this, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Our words do more good than we think, and our words can do more harm than we realize. The human tongue weighs less than three ounces, but its size to impact ratio is huge. James says this in James chapter 3, For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a, grand, or a great forest on fire. Here's the point to the verse and what James is trying to get at is, even though the storms are raging and the seas are rocky, that little rudder on that ship will direct the ship where it needs to go and get it to safety. Just like how if we're riding a horse, that little four ounce bit in that horse's mouth will direct where that thousand pound horse will end up. And so your tongue will direct your life. Your tongue has enormous influence and control of where you go. I don't know if you uh, remember being in school and getting word problems or not. My mom was a math teacher and she loved word problems. I, however, did not. Uh, word problems, of course, are uh, <laughs> sentences that you have to now figure out mathematically how to get something to work out, you know, at the end. And I shared this last service and some guy had it right in his head. So, and he said I was right. So, hey, uh, that's two people who know that this is right. So uh, it goes like this. So this is for all the math freaks out there. It goes like this. If a tongue weighs three ounces and there are 16 ounces in a pound, and if a person weighs 200 pounds, what percentage of their body is taken up by their tongue? Now, some of you are a little lost already. You're like three ounces, 16 ounces, 200 pounds. I don't even know like what's going on, you know, things like that. But here's the answer, 0.93. So you're like, what, what does that mean to me? Good job, you can do math. Here's what it means. 0.93% of your body is going to direct where the other 99% goes. So think about it, less than 1% of your body is going to direct where the other 99% goes. That three-ounce tongue determines a lot. And your tongue has enormous influence and control over your life. James says, so at the end of this verse, he says, But a tiny spark could set a great forest on fire. The tongue of yours can uh, turn the course of your entire life into a blazing flame of destruction. And some of you have done that with your words and with your mouth. We've all destroyed relationships or parts of our life with the words we say. But just like there's a ratio between um, uh, t uh, let's see, our tongue to our body, there's also a ratio between our toxic words and our life-giving words. In fact, every relationship rises and falls depending on the ratio of toxic words to life-giving words. And I absolutely believe this to be true. If you're struggling in your marriage, maybe this week it's been kind of a rough week or two or maybe a month or two or a couple years for you. My guess is that there are more toxic words than there are life-giving words in that relationship. If you're struggling with your son or daughter or maybe teenage son or daughter or even grown adult son or daughter, my guess would be that there's more toxic words in that relationship than there are life-giving words. Think through the relationships that you have in your life today. And ask yourself, what is the ratio of toxic words to life-giving words? And ask yourself, what is that ratio in each of those relationships? Proverbs 15.4 says, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. 
Gentle words like, I love you, I'm proud of you, you're the best, they bring life. They bring health to any relationship that you're in. And some of you could say a word like that to somebody today. You know today that you could think of somebody in your life that needs to hear a life-giving word from you. Maybe you need to tell your kids that you're proud of them. Maybe that's a word that you just need to start cycling in your vocabulary more and more. I know Jen and I, we always try to tell our kids anytime they do something, anytime they try something, that we're always proud of them. Whether they really succeed or whether they fail, we always tell them that we're very proud of them and what they're doing. Maybe for you, you need to tell your husband or your wife for the first time in maybe a long time that you love them. Maybe you're like, you know what? They don't deserve it. You don't know what they did. It doesn't matter whether or not they deserve it or not. It's about you breathing health and life back into that marriage. So think through the relationships you have and breathe life and health back into them with life-giving words. But the opposite is also true. Harsh words, harsh tones, they crush the spirit of any relationship. I remember a while back I was doing some shopping for the church and I was, I was uh, going up and down this aisle and I seemed to almost be following this mom, but she was kind of doing the same thing I was, hitting the same places. And I, I, this, this just really hasn't left me, and I've really just remembered this, and I, I don't really, well, I know why, but it's just, it was very shocking to me to see it. And I know that as parents, we all make mistakes. We all say things we shouldn't say. I know our parents probably said things to us that, you know, they probably shouldn't have said to, and we can all apologize for our harsh words or harsh tones, but this really caught me by surprise. And I'm walking down the aisle, and uh, she had four kids. She had one kid who was way behind her, kind of trailing behind. She had two that were kind of fighting and screaming and hitting each other. And she had another one crying in the basket. And what struck me was not how they were acting, but what she was saying. She was saying like, she was telling her son behind him, well, fine, then just stay there. I hope somebody adopts you and loves you and cares for you and gives you a home then. And that's what she said. And then the other two kids, they're hitting each other, they're screaming, and she's like, I can't take you anywhere. All you do is scream and yell, I'm going to smack you both when we get home. And then the other kid in the basket, she was saying, um, stop crying, you need to stop crying, and you know, just yelling at the kid who was crying. And what caught me by surprise was that here I could see the, the look on her kids' faces and how rejected they felt. And how their relationship with their mom was crushed. Now, she was right. The kid needs to speed it up. I mean, we know that our kids need to stay with us when we're shopping. We know that we can't take our kids everywhere when they're fighting and screaming and punching each other. We know that to be true. And I don't know why the kid was crying, but I'm sure the moments passed and, you know, the kid needs to stop crying. And she was right in all of those, but the way that she was going about it was completely wrong. Harsh words, harsh tones will crush the relationship that you're in. So in review, number one, my words affect my behavior. Number two, my words direct where I go. And number three, the reason to watch your words is my words have the power to bring life and death. Proverbs 15, 23 says, To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. How good is a timely word? We've all experienced it from time to time that a, a timely word is good for us. You know, somebody at some point in time in your life came in and said something that was encouraging, that made you excited, that made you joyful, that brought happiness to your life. Or maybe you're going through a season of life where it was really hard and you didn't know if you could make it through and somebody came in and, and said something very encouraging and very timely for you that helped you get through that season of life that you're in. Or maybe your life was going a totally different direction and a totally different course and somebody came in with love and compassion and helped change the course of your life. How good is a timely word? But we also know the opposite to be true. Proverbs 18, uh, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Every single one of us within us has the power of life and death in this one little muscle. I love you brings life. You make me sick brings death. I'm proud of you brings life. Why can't you get anything right brings death. Words are powerful. They can bring life and death. Or our words can be timely, good, helpful, fruitful to people. Or they could be destructive, bringing death to people's lives. You might remember that saying that uh, goes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. 
That saying rings quite hollow in reality, I think, because we know how powerful words can be. Words may not leave outward scars like sticks and stones might, but we all know and have experienced the bitter sting of a careless or cruel word. Every once in a while, I speak a careless or cruel word, whether it's to my wife or to my kids, to my friends, to my family. We all can think back on times that we've done that. We've spoken a reckless word to him, but here's what I want you to know. You won't be able to get rid of every reckless word in your life, but you can apologize for them. It's something that I'm trying to teach my kids right now. There's two, four, and six, and uh, they're sometimes fighting a lot over everything. And what I'm trying to teach them is even when I get caught up in the moment, that I apologize to them right away that I tell them that I'm sorry. And, he, and what I hope that shows them is that even though I have authority over them, even though uh, I'm their dad, I still make mistakes and I still need to apologize. And I hope that teaches them to give it to me when they're mean to me or to give it to each other, to apologize to each other when they're mean to one another. You know, Proverbs 15, 18 says that um, a hot-tempered person starts fight, but a cool-tempered person stops them. I like to think like hot-tempered people are people who will just lose their minds and just say whatever's coming out of their minds right away. And they'll just say it and it'll cut people down. Maybe you can do that. You know how to break people down with your words. You know just the right things to say to push the buttons to bring people down. But we need to be like Proverbs. We need to be a cool-tempered person. And when we become that hot-tempered person, when we start fights with our words, we're not going to ever get rid of them, but we can apologize for those words. There's not a person alive that doesn't want to hear the words, um, like, well done. You did a great job. You look great tonight. I'm proud of you. I love you. I'm so glad that you're my son. I'm so lucky to have a daughter like you. I believe in you. I'm praying for you. Every single person loves to hear those kinds of things. Ephesians 4.29 kind of sums up everything we've been talking about here. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Notice that phrase, only words that build people up. If we were to grade ourselves, if we were to test ourselves today and say, how are we doing with that? What would you give yourself? What grade would you give yourself? Are you a person who builds people up or are you a person who tears them down? We need to be people who are better at building people up. And if you don't know what those words are in your vocabulary, that you need to retire some of those phrases and comments that you need to retire from your vocabulary, well, then ask your friends, ask your family. They'll be glad to tell you. You just have to be willing to listen to it. But they'll tell you what words you need to retire. But what is unwholesome talk? It's foul or abusive language. Four-letter words do not honor God. People who walk around and say, beep this and beep that. We never look at them and go, you know what? That's a really self-controlled individual. And I think they're going places with their life. We never do that. None of us ever think that. It doesn't bring honor to God. If you want to honor God with your speech today, write down the words you need to get rid of. Have those conversations you need to have and stop saying those words. Or maybe there's a person in your life that you have conflict with. Try a timely word. Do what Proverbs 15, 23 says and give them a timely word and be cool tempered about it. You may think, well, they don't deserve it. You don't know what they said to me. You don't know what they said about me. It doesn't matter whether or not you, they deserve it or not. It's about you having the power with your mouth to bring life and health to your family, to your classroom, and to your workplace. So Mr. and Mrs. Mug, I think they've worked things out and I think they're better for it. But what's in you will inevitably come out of you. And so my question is, what's in you today? What it all comes down to, what it boils down to, is it's a heart issue. You may say, I really want to try hard to be this uplifting and this encouraging person. And then I just get a little stressed out and I get a little irritated. Or you think, I pray to the Lord to help me watch my temper, to be more patient. But then five minutes later, I go and I lose my temper anyways. Here's what I want you to do this week. Think of one or two places where you struggle with reckless words the most. Maybe for you, it's the kitchen. 
You know, your kids come in and they want to help you make breakfast, but really what that means is make a bigger mess for you to clean up later. And so you struggle with reckless words there, or uh, maybe for you, it's the fact that nobody ever helps you make dinner or helps you set the table or clean up the dishes. And so reckless words just come out every time you're in the kitchen. Or maybe for you, it's the car. You know, you're running a little late to something and some clown in front of you is going the speed limit and you're just like, I can't take it, it's driving you nuts. Or maybe for you, it's social media. I think a lot of times because we're not face to face, we'll say some of the most ignorant, hateful comments in our minds that we can come up with. And so maybe for you, you have social media muscles. You just let them flex and you say whatever you want to say. And that's a place that you struggle with reckless words. But this week, think of one or two places that you struggle with reckless words the most and memorize Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 and Ephesians 4, 29. You might think, well, I can't memorize anything. My mind is shot. Well, then write it down. Set a reminder for those verses to come up on your phone every single time. But start to memorize those verses. And here's what I believe will happen is that God's word will take root in your heart. And it'll change your heart. Not overnight, not in a week, maybe not even in a month, but over time, God's word will take root in your heart and you'll start noticing small little victories. And you'll notice that that three ounce tongue will be building other people up and directing your life in positive ways. I want to close our time with uh, Ephesians, or uh, not Ephesians, but Proverbs chapter 15, verse three. It says this, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. We've talked a lot about our words and our tongue and our mouth. We've said that it it affects our behavior, directs where we go, and has the power to bring life or death. And at first, when I was praying about what I would teach uh, in Proverbs 15, I was praying, Lord, show me what you would have to teach me, and then show me what I could teach the people of Awaken. And I landed on uh, these verses here that we've read uh, this morning. And, um, but what really kept stumbling me was the, the chapter or verse 3 right here. It goes, the eyes of the Lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good. Whereas verse 1 says a soft answer. The Verse 2 talks about the tongue of the wise. Verse 4 talks about a gentle tongue is a tree of life. And I'm going, why would you have the eyes of the Lord right in the middle of all of this with our tongue? You were kind of on a roll here, you know, guy. Why, why, are, you, why are you breaking this up a little bit? And so as I was rereading it and rereading it, this is what it taught me. It reminds me that anything I say, good or bad, is not hidden from God. That I could be in the most private place and say some of the worst things, but God still sees it. And even if I don't speak anything bad, even if, even if I'm just thinking it, God still hears it. God still sees it because he knows my heart and he's not caught by surprise by any of that. But I'll take it a step further, and I'm even going to say that there's some of us here who might be like, well, yeah, I could struggle with words, but really, it's the fact that I'm in the season of life right now, and I don't feel like the Lord sees me. Or maybe for you, it's praise the Lord and hallelujah on Sunday, but then Monday through Saturday, you live a completely other lifestyle. You have this other lifestyle away from church and that people don't know. God sees it, and God's not surprised by any of it. It doesn't catch him off guard. So when we think about God watching us, we might think, well, that's terrifying. But it all depends. If we're rebelling against the Lord, then the thought of him constantly watching us can be frightening. But if our hearts are right with him, then what an incredible comfort it is. He never loses track of us. He never loses sight of us. He never takes his loving attention from us, not even for one moment. God is watching us, but he loves us so much that he can't take his eyes off of us. We may lose sight of God, but God will never lose sight of us. And so my question for you today is this. When God looks at you, who does he see? Does he see someone who's trying to live their life, you know, live a life that's pleasing to the Lord, having a relationship with him? Does he see someone who's struggling in the relationship, who's feeling the pulls of this world towards them? And so now they're kind of falling away from their relationship with the Lord? Or does he see someone who's tried to be their own God, who's tried to do everything on their own, and it's now hit rock bottom, and it's like, I'm going to give this church thing a try. See, the thing is, when God sees you, he's not surprised by the good you've done, and he's not surprised the evil that you've done. He's not surprised about the evil that's in your heart either. 
And here's what he did. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins, for his son's body to be broken and his son's blood to be shed for your sins. So that when you stand before a holy and righteous God, like we all will one day, he'll look at you not because of all the sin and the junk you have in your life, but he'll look at you with his son's blood covering a multitude of your sins. So maybe today you need to confess for the first time with your mouth and with your tongue that Jesus is Lord. Or maybe you need to confess with your mouth and your tongue that you need to come back to Jesus and that you're repentant of the sins that you're in. Wherever you're at, it doesn't catch God by surprise. He still loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life.